Now we want to look at the adversary from the president of Ghana advocating for African leaders to invest 30 percent of their sovereign wealth in domestic financial institutions rather than foreign financial institutions to develop their balance sheet and also develop the African continent. We have the privilege of hosting once, once again the Honorary Consul General of Antigua and Barbuda to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We're being joined by Ambassador Williams Wallace. Glad you have you join us this morning. Good to see you again. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you again. All right. What will you Can make you of this uh, adversary from the president of Ghana advocating for African good, good. leaders to invest 30 percent of the sovereign wealth in domestic financial institutions rather than foreign financial institutions as it used to be the practice? Let's start with that. What's your reaction to these and what's your take on this? The so, potential benefits of investing in African, African financial institutions institution is, is that, that it can boost economic development. It can foster regional integration, and it reduces the uh, reliance on external financing. However, we have to highlight the challenges and the risks associated with implementing such a policy, including concerns about the stability and efficiency of African financial markets, political interference, and of course, the bane of all of Africa, corruption. So we need to consider the role of international cooperation as a step and coordination in supporting African countries' efforts to strengthen their financial sectors and attract investment. So the continent should look as a whole if we have to have a continental institution such like an African Union central bank will be to invite FDI, foreign direct investment, to the continent and then redistribute that finance for projects rather than we having to depend on IMF, you know, Bretton Woods and all these other institutions, the Chinese and others who come and plunder, you know, resources in exchange for paper fear. So why not use the resources of our uh, continent, uh, build our own central bank for the entire continent and then invite partnerships with the uh, financial institutions abroad as partners. So they are partnering with us based on our strategy, our policy, and our priority. And that's the importance. So whereas we, you know, see the benefits of investing in African financial institutions to boost economic development and foster regional integration, and reduce the uh, external financing, we got to step up to the plate and do the financing ourselves. I mean, if you look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia was a closed economy, a closed financial country, and they have been able to uh, battle non-colonial uh, interference to move. It's only now that they're opening up their financial markets for uh, the rest of the world. So maybe we should take a leaf out of the out of the uh, out of the Ethiopian model and pass that on to the African Union. Yeah. All right, Ambassador Wallace, good morning. It's great to see you again. Great to see you too. So you talked about there may be challenges with uh, African leaders actually uh, doing what um, the president of Ghana has proposed. What could be some of the challenges with depositing 30% of the foreign reserves in African financial institutions? Well, uh, it's about regulation. It's about uh, distribution and priorities for uh, projects. And that's why I'm suggesting that maybe now is the time for us to look at an African Union central bank so that you know we have a, a, a continental institution that is there to regulate that 30% and then you prioritize through the African Union because that is the, uh, that is the body for, uh, uh, for uh, the continent and use that as the 
uh, litmus test for distribution of that 30% for prioritizing projects. You remember I spoke before about the African Union should be the signatory for all contracts um, on the continent, not the individual nation states or countries. All right. You observe that most countries, they hold their reserves in foreign banks and most importantly in foreign currencies. Yes. Why do you think they are more comfortable with this practice rather than holding it in local currencies or in local institutions? Well, it, 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 that's a non-starter because all the local currencies, as you know, are depreciating uh, vastly quickly, and uh, uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, they have no value. I mean, if you look at Zimbabwe, I mean, it's a, it's a not case. If you look at uh, some parts of Central Africa, I mean, you, you can't use their currency anyway. So uh, I can see the reason and the rationale why they would want to hold uh, their reserves in a foreign uh, currency that, you know, is uh, is, is not is not uh, being depreciated wildly. But that is where we now need to find our own standard currency for the continent. And we can and should, and we are working on it. It, it is important because we have the reserves in terms of uh, natural resources to, uh, to shore up a currency that can compete with any other currency. So we need to get to that stage first. In the meantime, if you have out of uh, 52 states, 27, you know, currencies, it's a nonsense. And all of them are being, you know, depleted, you know, um, every day. I mean, just take Nigeria, the Naira, you know, a few months ago, it was how much to one? 700 to one? We are now 2,000 to one? I mean, <laughs> and it's a country that has oil and gas and uh, so much natural resources, but yet the currency is on a slide. All right, let, let's uh, look, talk about reduced returns. Now, it is argued that some of these international institutions offer higher returns. If the argument is true, taking 30% of the foreign reserve to African uh, financial institutions, will that in any way reduce uh, the chances or investment opportunities and economic growth? Well, you know, it's all about hedging. I mean, investment banking and investment bankers will tell you that they go into the financial markets to hedge and to look at the, uh, the best returns on their investment. So on the positive side, taking uh, some of the reserves you have and putting it into the international financial market and getting returns on that is at least a good hedge against your own currency being depleted and depreciated. However, um, it is important to know that there is also the risk factor that um, should uh, something go wrong and they normally do uh, with uh, the particular countries if they are being driven into uh, uh, conflicts and uh, all other things, their money is held. You know, and if uh, they, their leaders are corrupt, they, they, all, all kinds of excuses can be used to hold that money and uh, keep that uh, reserve that you have or have had put outside of the country. So the risk factors is that on the one hand, uh, you're hedging, right, um, which is positive. But on the other hand, you have the, the risk of it being uh, uncontrollable. You have no control over it once it's outside of your domain. All right. If, if, if the local currencies, they are depleting in value and uh, compared to the foreign currencies, don't you think this will further discourage the African leaders from yielding to this advocacy from the Ghanaian president? Well, they have not thought it through. You know, um, I, I have to mention and go back again to Gaddafi. Gaddafi had the model. He didn't have as yet um, what we now have present day. We now have a reason and a rationale to start putting together our resources. We have the ACFTA. It is a, the best organization to start 
uh, the process because there is now a vehicle that we can say, okay, let's standardize our currency contracts utilizing a standard sustainable uh, currency contract for all of our uh, trade. By doing that, you start putting confidence into the system because what does money need? Money needs a vehicle. Money needs uh, 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 a, a real track to run on. And we have that now. The ACFTA is the real track for uniting the currencies on the a single sustainable currency contract uh, to uh, trade. And uh, it is the best time for that. At that point in time, when Gaddafi was doing his model, uh, we did not have, and looking at a, a, a central bank for Africa, we did not have uh, the ACFT. Now we do. So there's no reason why they can't have the confidence to say, let us now look at standardizing a currency to trade with as a contract uh, system um, that the model is Euro and the model is Europe. That is what happened with Europe. Europe, in order to trade and to show up their currencies, which no one had confidence in, you didn't have confidence in the drama, the Greek drama. You didn't have con confidence in the uh, Italian uh, lira. You know, they were all, you know, not cases of, of fiat, just like we're having now on the continent. So what happened? They now had a standard uh, sustainable currency contract. And that now led to the evolution of the euro. And we should take that model now. And that is what some of us are working on, I must say. We are because we recognize the importance of the money staying in Africa and not risking it outside of the continent. Talking about risk, do these African institutions have the capacity to handle such capital coming into uh, the financial institutions? 30% of countries for reserve, take for instance Nigeria, and you have other African countries. So do you think they have the capacity to handle of, it? Of course we do. Of course we do, because we have men and women with banking, investment, and financial knowledge on the continent. All we have to do is have the institution and put in the regulations to keep those funds there. Um, and that is why I mentioned uh, having an African Union central bank. Um, if we do, you can bring all the people from our Afrexim Bank, from AFDB, all of those who have those experiences can run such a bank. Uh, you know, it's not... It's not rocket science. We have it. We have the knowledge base as Africans. Are we not having uh, a Conjuela uh, working for, you know, is it the World Bank and other institutions? We have the brain power. We have the knowledge. So there's nothing wrong with setting up the institution and bringing the inflows into that institution, regulating it and uh, monitoring it and uh, applying it, implementing it for, you know, uh, invest on the continent. We have it. Let's not fool ourselves to think that we must send those investments abroad. It's nonsense. We have what is required. Bring all the uh, African uh, brain power in finance and investment back home. Put an institution like an African Union uh, central bank together and bring them to the fore. We have Africa Bank. We have AFDB. We have, you know, all the other banking institutions, uh, individually in those countries, you pool the resources uh, and the knowledges of, of, of those personnel, and bingo, there we go. You know, we are not uh, utilizing what we have on the strengths. We are believing colonial mentality. We must take our money outside. No. Put the institution in place, bring the personnel, uh, pump the money in. Now, let's look at the role of financial agencies like the AFDB, the African Bank, uh, which uh, the Ghanaian president made reference to. He lathered the effort being made by AFDB during uh, COVID-19. Now, with this kind of advocacy coming up now, how will it play out if African countries now prioritize financial institutions like AFDB? And then how will you assess the leadership and the activities of these banks in recent times? Do you think, judging by the activities, this will warrant this kind of investment in a, in a kind of financial institution like the AFDB and the rest of them? 
Yeah, <laughs> we have a good uh, uh, leader uh, actually from uh, Nigeria, as you know, at the AFDB. Uh, again, I'm going back to having the personnel to run uh, these uh, organizations. Um, again, it's all about pulling our knowledge resources where that is concerned. Let us tap into what we have and have the confidence to operate, you know, and we can enlarge the FDB. Why do we have to have all other international bodies pumping money into the FDB so that they can make the decision making for us? No, we shouldn't. Uh, let us have our own funds so that we can be making those decisions ourselves and not having outside influence because too much. We keep having these outside in, uh, interests, outside funds, outside financing, which interferes with our strategic policy for the continent, that we cannot have a yearly plan, an African development goal, as I talked about, every year that we have our own goals and not be influenced by these other uh, uh, institutions outside who will keep telling us what to do because they have their funds in our institutions. All right, what about access? At a time that the, the funds may be needed, do you think that uh, with uh, the African financial institutions, they will be readily available as it is with uh, the international banks? Well, you are, you are talking about uh, prioritization of uh, projects. You're talking about uh, strategic um, priorities for individual nation states within the continent. Um, those things need to be discussed at a strategic level. Again, we're going back to the African Union. These things need to be discussed at a strategic level so that priorities are given and priorities are set as to what are the goals that we now, as a continent, want to prioritize. And each of these nation states come up and say, this is my priority for uh, 2024. They decide, sit down and decide which ones are going to be prioritized and access to those funds are now given because it is a priority for the continent. As like I said before, development goals. So is it this year? health for all, so we're building hospitals right across the continent, or is it secu food security for all, or is it infrastructure? And those funds are now prioritized because every nation state have agreed that that's a priority for the continent, so that no one feels left out that you took access to this money for, you know, a white elephant project. I think it should be a joint communication, joint understanding, joint agreement that these are the priorities for accessing those funds. And it must be transcontinental rather than individual. And if it's individual, it is because something disastrous happened and they said, let's have a priority because there was flooding in Mozambique and we need to build a bridge, etc. You know, it's all about, you know, prioritization and concomitant agreement of how we're going to use those funds. Earlier you talked about the need for the African continent to have its own central bank. Um, there's also advocacy for the African stock, uh, stock exchange and the investment yes. bank. Can you give us update as regards to what uh, African leaders are doing in this regard and what will be the impact of this on the continent if this becomes a uh, reality? Fantastic for me. Fantastic, Femi. We need, you know, there's going to be a leadership change in the African Union. So now we need a leader of the African Union who would now start to take the importance of prioritizing uh, the needs of the continent. And the needs of the continent have to have leadership focus. You know, um, the African Stock Exchange, why do we have to go to the London Stock Exchange for uh, uh, what I will call materials and metals on the continent. Our own stock exchange should re regulate our own prices for diamonds, for lithium, and all others. So it is the leadership of the African Union that we now decide and prioritize that we now do what is necessary. Set up our own stock exchange, and that comes from leadership within the Union. 
to say this is a priority. Set up our central bank and pool, you know, what we have together to ensure that we don't have to keep going to the London Stock Exchange, the uh, uh, American NASDAQ, etc. Let us have an African Stock Exchange, ASE, call it whatever we will. And therefore, we now are pooling our resources for our benefit and for our use, our implementation of our strategic goals. So it is leadership now that is required at the African Union level, because the African Union that's supposed to be doing these things and have not. They've been being influenced by outsiders, you know, whose priority uh, they have been following. I'm afraid that that is the truth. And long may they uh, quickly leave uh, their positions right now and have fresh blood in who will focus and face, you know, the continental requirements. All right. But... Um... Asking that African leaders deposit some percent of their foreign re reserves in African institutions, is that the only alternative to leaving the reserves in international uh, uh, institutions? What about investments in maybe bonds? In bonds? Bonds, investment Sorry, in bonds, or alternatives to keeping reserves in international institutions. You are so, you're, I'm sorry, I missed you there. Are you saying that we should float uh, uh, our own African bonds and invest in them? Is that what you're saying? What I'm asking is this, uh, looking at the alternatives to keeping reserves in international institutions, are there other ways to diversify? other than just keeping a, a part of it in the financial institutions in Africa, can they also be invested in institutions? Can they be invested in bonds as a way of diversifying what to do with the reserves? Of course, of course, they can be invested in institutions. We already have some institutions that are existing that need investment. You know, uh, take, for example, the African Development Bank, we can invest more and remove the outside investors from uh, international institutions who are taking, as I said before, a major play in the African Development Bank because they are contributing uh, to the bank's uh, uh, operations and to the bank's choice of investment. So if we pumped our money into such institutions, we now have uh, more of, I would say, control over uh, the investments that come to those institutions and the decision making on those institutions. So yes, I agree with that. And float bonds, absolutely. Because you may want to do rail infrastructure, uh, you may want to do roads across the continent, and you float bonds uh, for those type of major capital investments. All right, let's look at the issue of illicit financial flow in Africa, the issue of money laundry. What do you think should be the narrative to stop this trend? And looking at this kind of a, a platform, a, like an African financial institutions that can uh, tackle this kind of uh, practice in the continent, how do you react to this um, activities of uh, illicit uh, flow of uh, funds, money laundry in the continent, and how do you think this right. can be tackled? Yeah, it comes down to one, uh, uh, an area that I'm very familiar with because I, I, I used to do security printing. And, you know, all monies are security printed. Um, if we had, like the dollar, do you know that uh, every dollar you spend can be tracked because the Federal Reserve Bank who issues those dollars have serial numbers. Uh, if you go to the bank, for example, right now in Nigeria, if you're taking out dollars, you know they photocopy and they list all the serial numbers of the dollars to you, right? And therefore, they can track wherever that money has been used and who has been using it. So if we have to avert uh, money laundering <laughs> on the African continent, we need to standardize a currency and have those currency traceable and trackable. So um, at the moment, you know, you can't stop the money laundering because uh, 
each individual country, uh, at least 26 or 27 of them, have their own currencies and utilize them um, in any which way they, they want. And it is too multiple. It's too much multiple currencies to be able to stop the money laundering. So the only thing that can be applied to stop that or, or reduce it drastically is to have a standard currency with uh, serial numbering that is traceable and trackable. You know, so if you're talking about how do we stop such a major, because you have 52 countries with all different currencies in at least, you know, 27 of them, uh, how can you? You know, you have the uh, CFA, you have the uh, Ghana CD, you have the Naira, you know, people can do what they want within their own, you know, territory and their own currency. Difficult to follow, except you standardize a currency for the continent. But standardizing the currency for the continent, will that not make uh, producing the currency, so to speak, even more expensive? Would it require a higher cost to do that? Why would it? Because if everybody is contributing, I mean, it's, it's the same as going to the market. If you buy, uh, if you buy uh, one drink and instead you buy 10 cases of drinks, uh, you, your discounts are there, isn't it, for buying more? And if you have a volume, you should have the cost reduced for printing your currency as a standard currency because you're printing more and after your setup cost, you are just you know, printing and the cost per, uh, per, per currency is drastically reduced. It will not increase the cost, rather it will uh, reduce the cost of printing your own currency. Standardized across the continent. Ambassador Wallace, let's look at the mandate of the uh financial institutions in Africa, uh, the AFDB and the Afrexin Bank. Now, if you take a look at uh, part of the mandate of the AFDB, part of it is to mobilize resources for development. So now resources will be coming, let's assume that the uh, leaders accede to the call of um, uh, Nana Kufuado, and so 30% of each country's reserve is deposited in the AFDB because it seems to be like the biggest financial institution in Africa. Now, to what project do you think they should be committed to? It is one thing for the bank to have enough capital. It's another thing what they invest or what they put the money into. First and foremost, you know, if you look at what is currently the major projects on the continent is infrastructure. We need to open up rail and roads so that we can trade and travel. The continent has to be like Europe or the United States of America. So the first thing is people, movement, and goods on the continent. So any funding that is taken from each country, 30% of the reserves into the Africa. Of the continent. Was right the there, that that's a glitch, but okay, we require it's, it's, it's back now. Huh? Yeah, we require oh, infrastructure, infrastructural development. We require rails and roads and, of course, aviation. So more development in uh, air travel, more development in road travel, more development in rail travel, because we've got to move goods and people across the continent seamlessly. So that will be one of the first development that the African Development Bank with 30% of the funds from 52 countries in their bank's reserve will be focusing on. Thereafter is any other development. Is it hospitals? Is it schools? They are all development. They, they are the priorities that the continent need. We need to make our continent healthy. We need to educate uh, our continent. We need to invest in fintech, in IT, in digital products. So therefore, uh, if we put those funds into the African Development Bank, um, the priority will be, as I had mentioned before, 
uh, two or three interviews back, you know, we set up our own African Development Goals Initiative. So a yearly goal for the continent, and we think it's like a Marshall Plan. Why should we wait for 2063 and UN Development Goals and SDGs? No, let's have our own African Development Goals and put those monies into our own African Development Goals. I am a great believer in our Pan-African focus. Let us get our funds, our money, our resources for our people. Simple, straightforward. In African Development Goals, one of the things that could also facilitate that is the Africa having its own common currency. Over the years, this advocacy has been there. It's been an age-long advocacy. But why do you think African leaders, if I may use this word, permit me a foot dragging when it comes to having a common currency? What are the bottlenecks and what should be done to manage this kind of challenges so that the African continent can be in a better position to have trade within itself? Femi, you have, you have hit the nail exactly on the head. And, you know, I go back to what I said earlier. We have a vehicle now. The African free trade area, continental free trade area, is the vehicle. The standard currency to exchange goods and services is a standard currency contract. Fortunately, I am involved in working on that. And as I said two interviews back, um, I can't reveal much. But we have recognized the need, and I'm working with a team to uh, get that effective. PAPS, uh, as you know, is a settlement system, but we do need a standard currency contract to be able to trade and to be able to exchange seamlessly. Okay, let's um, take a look now at something else, but it also concerns Africa, and that's the relationship, the green relationship between Russia and Africa. Now, uh, Russia uh, said on Tuesday that it had shipped 200,000 tons of grains in humanitarian aid to six African nations. What do you uh, perceive as going on here between Russia and the new love for African countries? Yes. Well, I think Russia is being very smart at the moment. Um, they are filling the gap of the Ukraine um, and they are buying friendships by the grains, um, <laughs> to use a euphemism. Um, uh, the grain policy is to ensure that their influence on the continent is reinforced, apart from military support that they're giving some countries through the Wagner Group. Part of what they are doing now is ensuring that um, they feed the nations that are having problems with food supply and food security. So that becomes a, a friendly, um, you know, it's like what the Chinese are doing, you know, uh, giving loans. Now they are giving food. Uh, what's the main thing that is concerning the continent? It's food and food supply. Um, but uh, that comes uh, at a risk as well because uh, it means we are not becoming dependent on developing our own grains. Malawi, uh, Nigeria, and others, well, I know Nigeria is doing their own and uh, developing their rice and uh, other grains. But other countries who are struggling to develop their own wheat and grains, you know, um, and getting it for free, you know, uh, or, or easily from uh, Russia, they are going to be seen as friends. So it's a strategy. It's an international policy strategy. Talking about this, uh, uh, this move on the part of Russia, will you consider it to be more of a geopolitical thing, um, maybe politics at play, rather than providing humanitarian services? Uh, yes, uh, there is absolutely... Uh, no doubt that that is so, um, because uh, the uh, if you have to evaluate the motives behind Russia, delivery of humanitarian aid to African countries, you have to consider its geopolitical interests, diplomatic objectives, and economic opportunities. Then we need to examine the potential implications of Russia's aid for food. 
security, agricultural development, and dependence on external assistance from them, you understand, in recipient countries. Now, we have to discuss the need for transparency where this is concerned, accountability, and monitoring mechanisms, you know, to ensure that the humanitarian aid is effectively targeted and distributed to those in need. So rather than being used for political or strategic uh, purposes, we need to know, is it getting to the people that it needs to get to? Um, is it transparent? How is it being, you know, um, uh, 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 put to use? You know, and are we getting dependency or transfer of skills? Are they going to bring with the grain say, okay, we'll help you to develop your grains. Let us bring the equipment for you and let us train you to develop uh, uh, your own um, food security in grains. We give you a, a kickstart. Here's the seeds. Here's the grains in the first place. But over the next three to five years, we are bringing seeds. We are bringing equipment and we are training you to be self-sufficient. That is more important. And if they are doing that, then they are good friends and good partners to Africa where that is concerned. Okay. Uh, some analysts globally have uh, described this uh, move by Russia as strategic, and they also uh, say it is geopolitics and that Africa has become a uh, ground uh, for such play. Now, what's is to be done at this point because it is not only Russia that is making such strategic move. What can Africa do at this point to ensure it doesn't remain a playground for such move and it takes advantage of this? Well, as I just said, one, we have to develop our own. So uh, what you have to do is have a strategic partnership. You say to Russia, Russia, Thank you very much for your grain. But we need, over the next two to three years, we need seeds, equipment, training to become self-sufficient. So if we are not to be seen as a dumping ground for geopolitics between you know, uh, the West and Russia and China and others, let's have transfer technology. Let's develop local content. I'm a strong advocate of local content, and I preach it. I brought it to uh, Nigeria in the oil and gas sector. So I am uh, an adv advocate of local content development, transfer of knowledge, and uh, development of uh, our own uh, skill set and our own knowledge base, and also manufacturing of equipment to do the job. So let's have those as part of the partnership with a country like Russia, if we have to. Um, show that we are uh, standing on our own and not allowing ourselves to be uh, manipulated, maneuvered into these uh, conflicts which are international and they are coming to us to play the game of geopolitics. So let's move geopolitics all the way and tell them straight, we are not interested in the geopolitics and your geopolitics. We're interested in what you can do for us and what you are going to give to us to help us to be self-sufficient to be help us to compete just like you. And we have the vast agricultural lands. We have the manpower, and we certainly have the soil content to uh, make Africa one of the exporters of uh, grain, you know, but intra-Africa, we will be self-sufficient. And that's what the strategy should be. Let's be self-sufficient within the continent, you know, Bring on your technology, bring on your skill set, bring on your manufacturing uh, knowledge, and let's partner with you. If you really love Africa and you really love these countries that you're giving grain to, let us and you demonstrate to us and to the rest of the world that you are a true friend and partner. All right, what a way to wrap up this conversation. We just need to thank you for your time. You know, uh, no doubt you are the right man for this kind of conversation based on your wealth of experience and what you do. You provided the right insight. You're passionate about Africa. I want to thank you for your time, your commitment, and your submissions on the thank issue you. of Africa. We are hoping that our leaders will eat to this kind of adversary and Africa will be a better place for it. Thank you so much for your time, Ambassador. Cheers. Change the leadership. Change the leadership. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs>
All right, let's see how that will play out in coming months. Thank you so much for your time, sir. We really appreciate it. Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development.